Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought. My name is John Shook, and I'm the president. We have the other two directors of the Institute here with us, Randall Oxier and Larry Hickman. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, the American Institute for Philosophical and Cultural Thought uh, fosters the study of philosophical and cultural thought in America, and uh, we collect this is an archive and a library. We provide access to these resources to all sorts of visiting researchers, both domestic from here in America and international around the world. Uh, we have approximately 25 to 30,000 books, we're not clear, uh, under this one roof, and uh, collections of papers as well. And uh, we can host workshops and seminars like this one tonight fairly frequently. Uh, this space is also available for various kinds of receptions and musical events and other sorts of events of interest to the community and the academic community nearby at the Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. We also have a resident fellowship program. Do we have any fellows here with us well, presently? Paul Cherlin. <laughs> Myron Jackson is here with us, so good to see you folks. Uh, we believe that this institute has opened and is operating at a crucial time for humanities in America. Uh, there is a growing neglect for the humanities across institutions of higher education in America, and there is a, a widespread tendency, we worry, uh, to neglect uh, humanistic learning in our culture, and uh, we fear that it's getting worse and worsening. So. We are in defiance of that uh, pessimism here. This is a, an act of bold optimism. And uh, so we decided to create a home, uh, a community for humanistic thinking and learning. And we are devoted to conserving and conveying that treasure of, of inherited values and achievements on into the future. So we're glad to have you here, and uh, we regard uh, events such as these as a very good sign that there remains to be continued interest in uh, humanistic thought, philosophical thought, and American culture. Uh, it, it, it is still alive and well, and uh, we can treasure it and pass it on. So the next person who is going to speak is Randall Oxier, who will do some further introductions. Thank you very much for being here. This is a cookie. This cookie was paid for by the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity. In addition to this cookie, however, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has sponsored this spring conference for um, uh, creativity, and in particular this year's spring conference, this is the first year, we're going to do it for at least three years, but possibly beyond that, um, was Creativity, Pragmatism, uh, and Logic. And so we've had uh, an afternoon of uh, papers on the topics of creativity, pragmatism, and logic. And the Central Society for the Philosophy of Creativity, which is being re restarted as of this evening with this ceremonial cookie, um, uh, is, is, is going to be having a spring conference every year here. The Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity has partnered with the AIPCT um, for lots of different programming, including a summer dissertation fellowship. The first one was this past year. We've got another one uh, coming up this summer, uh, and that has been a very successful program. The Han Lectures, the fourth of which was this past summer, and the fifth one will be this next summer, Ken Stickers will be our Han lecturer, and I look forward to a full day of activities associated with that. And on into the future, the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity intends to interact with AIPCT and to promote the study of creativity, especially the philosophical study of creativity. Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity and its associated societies, Pacific Division, Eastern Division, this one, was started in 1957 by William S. Minor, who was a professor of communication studies at SIU, a rhetoric professor essentially, but the philosophy of communication was his specialty. And those societies have carried out 
important research and have facilitated important research now for 62 years. And so uh, we intend to continue that and we intend to continue it here. And so it's natural given that the, these foundation, the foundation and these societies were started at SIU Carbondale that they should continue to be based here and continue to do their programming here. Okay, so. welcome to session two of the Spring Conference on Creativity. And our second speaker is Myron Jackson, who holds the Bessel Family Chair, of, Chair of, Ethics, of Ethics and Religion, Religion and, society. and Society. Right. In the it's a long title <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, at Xavier University in Cincinnati. And, um, uh, and so uh, Myron got his PhD some time ago here at SIU Carbondale uh, and has uh, been, been the itinerant scholar. Uh, uh, in demand in uh, upper Midwestern states uh, <laughs> since then. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming, and it's a pleasure to be back again. I was just here uh, last November uh, doing a keynote. So um, it is an honor to be here. I'm very thankful to the Institute and all their support. I'm thankful to Xavier University as well uh, for allowing me to do this, this research. So I want to uh, present a paper today entitled Seeing Without Being Seen, a look at pragmatic Afro logic behind the veil. And I, I have uh, four quotes that I want to read, but let me start out with just two quotes, and then uh, I'm going to be doing some reading and some talking. Um, so my first quote is from Marx in um, his Louis Bonaparte, and he says, Hegel says somewhere that great historical facts and personages recur twice. He forgot to add once as tragedy and again as farce. And then our key quote for today comes from W.E.B. Du Bois, 1903, The Souls of Black Folk. He says, after the Egyptian and Indian, the Greek and the Roman, the Teuton and the Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness but only lets him see through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on and amused contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, Two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged, dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. So that is the famous quote of double consciousness. Two-ness comes natural to human beings. This is me. Um, in this paper, I will argue that Du Bois' phenomenology of double consciousness and its gift of second sight details a pragmatic logic rooted in pan-African experience that has been democratized as a necessary way of life for us all. Double consciousness is a normalized operation for humans interacting and mobilizing themselves in our infospheres and ethnoscapes of today's cultural exchanges. Before, splitting, before the splitting of the atom, Du Bois articulated the inner workings of double consciousness detailing its advantages and disadvantages, its curses and its blessings, brought on by the trauma of transatlantic slavery and colonialist crimes against humanity. Du Bois failed to see, however, how Europeans emerged from a double consciousness peculiar to themselves as well. After all, Anglo-Saxon is already a kind of hybrid. It's already a kind of mixture. It's a, a kind of um, negotiation and um, compromise, so to speak, uh, of the um, different uh, English or, and Scottish sex. Moreover, while African Americans endured and experienced this tensional struggle at the heart of human identity, Europeans only reluctantly and implicitly recognized double consciousness by coming into contact with forms of white freakishness and self-disenchantment. What Du Bois cleverly discerned was gradually realized to be the basis of human nature for 21st century post-Kantian philosophical anthropology. Personal identities are more like processes of complex rather than simple unities. Mm 
Identities are not ready-mades, I will argue, and therefore they cannot be put into abstract caricatures of who we are. Um, I want to argue that we are all not individuals, but individuals, and this kind of individuality is what allows us to avoid these kinds of ethno-narcissisms and perverse uh, nationalist egoisms, as you were talking about, Matt, earlier. Uh, a reconsideration of Du Boisian phenomenology helps us take seriously the complexities of I that identity plays in our world and appreciate the rich, rich and dynamic ways in which doubled existence of blackness contributes to and conditions how we understand and ritualize identities today. More importantly, Du Bois's Afro logic of second sight works to counter the subtle dangers of collective culture inherent in the toxic divides that drive identity politics. So I think that double consciousness is something that we all have had and that European culture uh, was late to the party, especially European philosophy, philosophical anthropology was late in recognizing this. But it was Du Bois who was able to express and articulate it in the experience of African Americans in an explicit sense uh, that give us an awareness of it. So I wanna start with an analogy uh, the British naturalist William Harvey uh, is known for um, his revolutionary theory of blood circulation. What a lot of people don't know is that the heart was taken at the time to be the central organ directing all things of the body. Absolutely, without any internal needs of its own, and essentially was analogized with the different omnis, the logic of omnis that you had in medieval theology when uh, God was talked about. Um, the heart, as this kind of god, was demystified under Harvey's microscope because he surprisingly revealed how the body relied on an intricate network of veins. These conclusions brought the supremacy of the heart down, and in dethroning it, uh, there was a realization throughout Europe. It was a warning to popes and rulers that absolute monarchy was being replaced with constitutional monarchy. And so I want to use this analogy to say that just as the heart was desanctified in the 17th century, the self has undergone a similar fate in the 20th century. And one of the greatest American public intellectuals, W.E.B. Du Bois, articulated that through double consciousness, uh, representative of the psychic wounds that African Americans, um, African -Americans experienced. Um, based on this juxtaposition of double consciousness, we now have a full radical notion of subjectivity. Don't got time to go into it in this paper, but I want to suggest that it may be a superjectivity uh, related to Whitehead's language, but that's for another day. The self and other of classical metaphysics, a kind of pre-Nietzschean notion, uh, fused to represent a mutual eminence of embodied by unity of consciousness. This is to say that we're already couples with ourselves that we're already in a kind of relationship with ourselves, whether that be um, as a student and teacher, whether that be as a trainer and a trainee, whether that be as uh, a chef and a patron, et cetera. Um, they reinforce and complement each other, these various couples that make up our identity in this personalized ways. Selves and others are not really opposites in the sense of the law of excluded middle or in the law of non-contradiction. Yet they are rather real contrasts rather than opposites uh, that are excluded. We are already others, and if we, if we want to continue to call them this, whether knowingly or not, this division or two-ness speaks to the nuanced realities of self-consciousness that, that its, its German idealist progenerators could never have fathomed. I want to argue that they didn't go far enough because they believed so much in the dialectic that they didn't realize that two-ness actually implied a kind of inversion of the dialectic. Historically, the concept of selfhood, I want to suggest, has been a sort of fiction. And its costs are seldom considered. There is a strong case to be made that such fictions are necessary for human beings in the same fashion that Aristotle argued that imitation is natural and good for us. We desire that the artists portray as being younger, or more attractive, or thinner than we actually are. Some of this is healthy for human existence, the only animal that wears clothes. But we have to be mindful not to lapse into destructive fantasy or those imaginative propositions that inhibit, inhibit our potential for freedom or possibility within our own identity. So I wanna argue that we have much richer or uh, uh, more um, uh, uh, um, 
vast notions of identity that uh, are usually shut down through this kind of uh, either monotonic or uh, uh, bivalent um, kind of approach that um, doesn't see the plurality of identity. Um, the uncertainty and the decentralization of power that has erupted in the post-Cold War world uh, or climate of geostrategic politics has spawned a kind of psychosocial movement of fear and powerlessness. But what I want to suggest is that we are witnessing the demystification of social conventions and unmasking systems and institutions of established hypocrisy that the individual self or modern subjectivity is a part of or is a result of. Or, and also, uh, I believe, facilitates it or continues to perpetuate these attitudes uh, related to, uh, in a broad sense, uh, psychosocial um, phob phobocratic tendencies or fear-laden. Um, th what I mean by fear is, let me be clear, closing oneself off. Uh, this identity that doesn't uh, reach for these possibilities and doesn't see this kind of matrix of um, couplings or uh, of selves um, falls into a kind of self-enclosure into a kind of misery. Um, as Du Bois pointed out, to possess double consciousness is a blessing in disguise, mainly due to the fact that by Judeo-Christianity's own reckoning, holiness is identified with humility or mental shallowness. So I wanna emphasize this point here, uh, and I'm gonna read a quote. The holy man must not know about his own situation, even though he is the first who should know. Holiness seems attainable only at the price of a kind of mental shallowness, as it is incomparable with self-reflective individuality, a trait that, as a remark uh, by uh, Lumen, the um, uh, communication theorist, the saints share with the heroes in the modern novel. So by our own account of holiness, I want to suggest there's a sense in which it's associated with a mental shallowness. Dostoevsky referred to Jesus as the idiot, the uh, divine idiot. And he didn't mean this in a derogatory sense. Double consciousness and how Du Bois was explaining the plight of African Americans to me represents this kind of quote unquote mental shallowness. Again, not in a derogatory way. So ironically, it is the African American's condition of being behind the veil and having double consciousness that sets Christianity itself up. If you wanna go down that road, Du Bois didn't necessarily wanna go down that road, but I think that um, he is actually more consistent with the notion of what Christianity demands by this notion of um, a real humility that we don't take in cynically. Because when many people think about holiness or humility today, they're very cynical because they think that you're too conscious of it. You're performing it. You're aestheticizing it. Uh, it's opportunism. African-Americans and Afro-descended peoples are some of the most critical and reflective minds that humanity has to offer. <coughs> it is just that blacks were associated with being intellectually inferior compared to Europeans and therefore incapable of critical thinking uh, in a rational capacity. This derogatory attitude meant that the only value being appropriated to the black body was as a source of bondage and servitude. And another quote here, um, the slaves were the martyrs whose toil made progress possible. This is from Whitehead. Uh, there is a famous statute of the Scythian slave sharpening a knife. His body is bent, but his glance is upward. The figure has survived the ages, a message to us all of what we owe to the suffering millions in the dim past. Uh, and it's uh, also something I want to point out is how we usually don't know the names of the lynching victims or of these slaves. And there's a sense in which that invisibility thesis that extends from uh, Ralph Ellison um, to me speaks to being pregnant with these possibilities of the matrix matrices of selves. And therefore, there's a richer sense of self-disclosure there uh, rather than in this prerogative of subjectivity that you get within the... Um, Europe, European modern traditions. Likewise, there is no longer a false sense of certainty in the way Du Bois depicts double consciousness and uh, experiencing the world behind this veil and in this kind of tornness um, because it is presupposed that there's a kind of crippling and a kind of blinding in our appropriations that has to be taken into consideration. This actually makes us an more anti-fragile rather than fragile. 
It is when we turn to in, it is when we turn to ready-made identities that a certain fragility emerges uh, of having all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. African Americans internalized the Lord bondage dialect that you get in Hegel uh, with the uh, freed up versatility of thinking compared to the prerogatives of a unified self-consciousness. So what I want to suggest is that African Americans, like Du Bois said, had internalized the Lord bondage relationship uh, that Hegel articulated. And I want to suggest that we have all done this in our own ways, not just the African American. And so now I want to get into the second part of the paper, which is how Europeans came to this realization in another way. They came to it first through some, I start with Shakespeare. You can start in other places, but I prefer Shakespeare. We can all relate to the famous line from As You Like It of how we are all actors on the world stage. And this acting on the world stage ends up trickling down into the 20th century and you get the little known uh, philosophical anthropologist Helmut Plesner. And Plesner is famous for um, coming up with the idea that human nature is based on eccentric positionality, that we are all eccentric, that what we have is not only ourselves, but a positing of ourselves, almost like a mirror image reflection of ourselves. And therefore we talk to ourselves, we perform for ourselves, etc. This has been largely accepted and incorporated in many different uh, philosophical anthropologies of the 20th century. And this is how, over time, Europeans have accepted this two-ness. They have accepted this doubleness within that is constitutive of human nature. So there was a great flaw in Hegel's exquisite account of self-consciousness that Du Bois relies on. Uh, the African-American philosopher William Ferris acknowledge that both thinkers, uh, both Du Bois and Hegel implicitly assume that only a particular kind of recognition will suffice to register what a supreme picture of self-consciousness looks like. They did, not they did not envision that you are being observed by an unfriendly other. It was much more of a other that even though you were at odds and in tension with each other, uh, there was always a kind of hidden reconciliation under the table or coming through the back door. And so the system in a certain sense was rigged. And so this dialectic is not as free, I want to argue. It's much more term deterministic. And Ferris was able to pick this out. Ferris complains that we see, he, he says this about Du Bois, um, we see in Du Bois' dark water, his autobiography that he wrote later on, the agony of a soul of a Negro of mixed blood uh, uh, twisting and turning in the cage in which the Anglo-Saxon has confined it. It is the white blood of Du Bois crying for his own. This is why he has fallen into Hegel's trap. It is the disinherited colored offspring and offshoot of the Caucasian weeping and welling, cursing and damning because he has been disinherited by his Caucasian brother. So essentially uh, what Ferris is saying is that Du Bois got caught up in identity politics. And so Du Bois, without intending to, falls into sounding like Hegel or falls back on the same uh, uh, tools or um, resources uh, that Hegel relied upon. Du Bois failed to see how Europeans from their, uh, formed their own kind of double consciousness too. And therefore, uh, it took a long time uh, African Americans recognized this tensional struggle at the heart of identity uh, for themselves, whereas Europeans only reluctantly and over time implicitly were willing to recognize this. Um, Plessner described this eccentricity of humans, which is our capacity to place ourselves next to ourselves, to occupy a double eminence of self and other, but an other that potentially is unfriendly. Looking back with the gaze as if one were in a constant present of the unfriendly other, the power of the image and the reflection in the mirror function, as a, uh, function in the light and the glass to draw a contrast that shapes the contours of any experience related to our identity. And this must be taken into consideration when we engage in exercises of self-examination. Can we imagine anyone who would want to be anything other than bilingual or tri trilingual today? Anyone who wishes to have a liberating effect on humans in a specific sense must be not so much an envoy with a transcendent message as a human being whose directly evident otherness fully replaces the bringer of news from beyond in a real presence. 
What are our civilizations other than operations that want to extend cultural influence in further, faster, and higher ways? And this is the same thing I believe with regards to our identity and with regards to our freedom. So I, I'm, I've always, it's always troubled me how we actually inhibit or work against the riches that are here that are suggesting. Admittedly, um, it cannot be overlooked that philosophers have articulated several paradoxes around individuality and identity that are beyond the scope of this paper, but they are interesting nevertheless. For example, if I consider what an individual is from the philosophy of biology, we might ask, do we take the human being to be a free entity in its existence with microorganisms, or should we understand each microorganism as a separate entity? It's very difficult, if not impossible, to untangle this web of agencies in a non-arbitrary fashion. Philosophers will continue to grapple with these difficulties, but my aim is to show how much of these efforts converge to critique unilateral and nu uh, nuances of conflicting loyalties. Uh, one of the important tasks that philosophy must confront. If the last few centuries have taught us anything, it is that identities are anything but simple and trivial. By appealing to a plurally plural form of relational identity, to get at the values of subjectivity, along with a kind of ironic relationality, we can abandon the notion of self as a vacuous actuality in Whitehead's terminology, what we were talking about last paper. So, individuals and multiple personalities. I wanna quote from Nietzsche's We Philologist. It is a book that was uh, posthumously published uh, in its volume eight in his collected works. And Nietzsche, quote, uh, Nietzsche says, quote, vanity, is the involuntary inclination to set oneself up for an individual while not really being one. That is to say, trying to appear independent when one is more likely dependent. The case of wisdom is the exact contrary. It appears to be dependent or interdependent in reality rather than independent. Nietzsche's diagnosis, this is me here, Nietzsche's diagnosis on the pathology of Western individualism has still not been felt and appreciated to this day, I contend. But it is just as significant as the off-sided announcement that God is dead, and probably more so. I think it's more relevant, actually. Um, being individual may be a useful fiction, as in court cases for corporations, but it is often a hindrance and just that, a fiction. There are no individuals, really, because none of us can claim to be uncut or undivided. When I say incomplete, it means non-complete. When I say indirect, it means indirect. When I say individual, it means not divided or uncut. And to me, that's unrealistic. And you're really dealing with, well, like Carl Becker said in his book on the 18th century philosophers in the heavenly city, that you're really talking about yourself, but you project this kind of natural rights, uh, human nature doctrine that you universalize but you're really talking about your specific self and claiming to be talking on behalf of all people. Um, De uh, Deleuze picked up uh, where Nietzsche left off and moved beyond the concept of individuals. Instead, he proposed that humans are more accurately described as individuals. We are cut and divided in many ways, and this gives us the historical routes that uh, comprises our real identities. Identity cannot be thought of as just a subject object predication but develops from a logic of subjects that manifest superjects articulated in Whitehead's philosophy. Uh, identities in the conventional sense are constantly and continuously postponed, is what Deleuze said. It is not a matter of whether or not the self will become the other. It is already assumed to be the case, and more fundamentally, uh, the question involves how we will go about acquiring such identities and divided loyalties. So I want to move to the next, the last section of the paper where I discuss this, um, where I get into identity politics, being torn in different directions. So social psychologists have uh, a term that refers to um, the, when, when you have the, it's called the stereotype threat. When you have the presence of a threat, a harm, or just the lack of a peace of mind because you are, believe you're in the presence of racism or discrimination or sexism, uh, the idea is that you will underperform, that you will work against yourself. And what I wanna suggest is double consciousness is a way for us to combat this kind of stereotype threat that immediately takes over 
uh, our psychosocial uh, uh, attitudes and it gives us a kind of anxiety that makes us close down and we become manipulators of others and this is what identity politics is I believe in a lot of ways is uh, platforms for hate as well as manipulating others through your own social enclosure and so I um, in a recent episode of Hidden Brain, they had the chance to interview Annie Duke, who is a famous, believe it or not, poker player. She won $2 million. Now, it is said that the world of poker is less diverse than the UFC. <laughs> There's more women in the UFC, supposedly, than uh, who play world, uh, it's a man's world. And so what they were interested to find out how she reacted to the stereotype threat in these very tense um, uh, situations where there's a lot at stake. Um, and so you might conclude from the poker world demographics that it has been ungendered compared with other high profile sports. She retells her journey working hard to be accepted and victorious by her male competitors. Stereotype threat allowed her to categorize three types of players that she was able to identify based on how they would treat her as a girl. And here they are. Number one, there was the self-interested chauvinist. This was the person who was willing to do whatever she wanted in order to get her to like them, to get approval from the, the other in the eyes of the stereotype threat. And so she was able to easily manipulate them or at least she felt like they weren't being, they were never being sincere and they were just looking for an opportunism or uh, pleasure out of her. The second type is the deflationary chauvinist. These are uh, my uh, categories. I've named, labeled these categories this way. Uh, assume, uh, the, the deflationary chauvinist assumes that all the stereotypes of the, about that race or about that gender are true. And therefore they always lowball, they always uh, assume that you are behind and that they're always two steps ahead. And so she said that this was the, th these people were very passive and very, uh, um, they were easy to take advantage of because um, they always assumed and prescribed a norm of inferiority and indecisiveness on, beh on behalf of uh, who they were um, uh, in, in the presence of as the other. The final um, chauvinist was the inflationary chauvinist. And this was the person who wanted to confirm the stereotype. So you couldn't bluff this person. You couldn't trick this person because this person was very careful and their goal was to confirm that you were uh, the inferior uh, sex or uh, of a lower uh, inferior race. What all of these reveal to us is that if you fall into the stereotype threat trap, you actually live up to the stereotype. This is what she was saying, or this is how she felt when she was interviewed on Hidden Brain. I highly recommend that uh, episode. So um, she wanted to say that our identities uh, and using these identities as the labels that we are, as recipes for ready-mades, ended up making her uh, fulfill the stereotypes and she wanted to say that she did not help out her profession, that she did not help out her field in the way that she was wanting to in the sense of bringing discrimination and openness or uh, bringing uh, diversity and openness to it. So she, there was a loss of double consciousness or double consciousness was quickly dissolved is what I want to say. So we need to embrace being torn in many directions or uh, being pulled in many directions. And I want to end since I'm... Um, since I'm coming up on the end of my time here, I want to end with a quote from Du Bois from Darkwater, where uh, he kind of, um, he wrote this much later. And in Darkwater, he has a chapter called The Souls of White Folk that a lot of people don't uh, reference or talk about. But this is where I think he was trying to work his way into how white folks are also uh, driven by these burdens or driven by these kinds of uh, conflicted loyalties. And so he writes, we must really uh, envision the wants of humanity. We must want the wants of all men. We must get rid of the fascination for exclusiveness. Here in a world full of folk, men are lonely. I think we can all relate to this in our age of connected isolation. Uh, the world's already digitally connected, but it doesn't seem like we're connected using uh, boundaries and territories from uh, post-Westphalia. The rich are lonely as well. We are all frantic for fellow souls, yet we shut souls out 
and bar the ways and bolster up the fiction of the elect and the superior when the great mass of men is capable of producing larger and larger numbers of every human height of attainment. To be sure, there are differences between men and groups than there, er, than there ever will be, but they will be differences of beauty and genius and of interest that is not necessarily based on ugliness, imbecility, and hatred. And what I want to suggest is that individualism or modern subjectivity in this broad sense has contributed to the kind of exclusiveness that Du Bois worked tirelessly his whole life in a lot of ways to resist, to combat, to deconstruct. Thank you. Um, uh, what I want to do is I want to bring out something that I see uh, implicit in your paper and see what you have to say about it. Uh, so <laughs> it's funny that Matt's talking about dipolar uh, time, and, and, and you've got you've got the, almost the same thing except a socio-cultural version of it. But <clears throat> but is a individual um, uh, in a better position relative to creativity? Than, uh, uh, than an individual, which is a fiction, of course, from, from your point of view, uh, but, but, but is, is the individual the, the, the creative power in culture? Um, uh, and if so, what about um, this div dividedness uh, or doubleness? Uh, what is it that makes one creative as opposed to, for example, psychotic? Mm. Um, <clears throat> yes, yes, very good question. So there's That's harmonious right. individuality yeah. and then there's schizophrenia. And <laughs> well, I think that there it may be a blurred line in terms of it might not be easy to clearly distinguish. I think maybe we can get some distinctions. Uh, I immediately thought when you said that of George Yancey's op-ed that was in the New York Times at the beginning of uh, this month, a couple weeks ago, where he argued that the, uh, the phenomenon of blackface actually helped uh, or uh, aided in uh, white consciousness coming to terms with its own freakishness, with its own forms of otherness. Mm -hmm. And accepting this, it worked its way out of or de started to deconstruct the notions of purity or the notions that are associated with whiteness, the qualitative connotations. Uh, and so I want to say that there's a little bit of crazy in that. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of psychotic in that. Mm -hmm. But there's also, back to your paper, the richness of hidden possibilities. And the richness of hidden possibilities can be very revealing. Uh, they, can disclose, they have more self-disclosure in them, I would, I would contend, than the typical labels and the way that we go around identifying ourselves in these abstract ways, and these ready-made ways, mm -hmm. as, I, as I said throughout the paper, uh, using Duchamp's term, Marcel Duchamp. Uh, so... So, to, so I would have to say, um, yes, I think that there's a lot of possibility for creativity in double consciousness because your uh, individuality is allowing you to see all the ways in which you're cut and, and the ways in which you could possibly be cut. Mm. So, yes, yes, and uh, even though even though it's only hypothetical, you don't necessarily yeah. have to be cut in that way, but you consider, mm -hmm. what if I were gay? Yeah. What if I were black? What if I were white? Mm -hmm. Those things are possibilities that the individual doesn't even seem to register. It seems like the individual is more concerned with submerging or suppressing those things. Mm -hmm. So so the individual um, moves from possible to actual better. In fact, the individual has a false actuality <laughs> that uh, or, hadn't, or hadn't thin, thought of that a thin actuality yeah that, it's that certainly just, thin. That just repeats yes. itself mm -hmm. yeah whereas the individual is going to move from the possible to the actual as a it's like, it's like what what if i were right. yeah okay, uh, i really like how you said that because i do say in the paper i wasn't able to get to it all uh -huh. uh, it's about it's about 14 pages but i mm -hmm. do say that uh individuals are much thicker mm -hmm. whereas individuals are thin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Okay, uh, first of all, I like, really appreciate your talk. You brought together uh, a lot of interesting things in a way that I, even though I thought about the pieces, hadn't put them together in quite the way that you did. And so one thing, the thought that you sparked, you're talking about how um, sort of white Europeans only came late to the realization of their own sort of double or divided consciousness or something like that. And I loved the way that you put 
not just Du Bois in the tradition of German idealism of Hegel, etc., etc. Et yeah. But <laughs> don't tell Happy. You know, that's a, <laughs> Happy's entire book. That's right. right. Yeah. But, He's a uh, German idealist. But right. then I love, and this was a little bit offhand, but I think that there's a lot of insight, sort of undercurrent in your paper in this when you brought up the Dostoevsky, the Jesus as the divine yeah. idiot, because. Uh, a point that I've heard Randy make before is that people often underappreciate how uh, influenced by his religion Hegel was, right? And when you thought, when you said that, it made me think one of the oldest examples of a double consciousness or a triple consciousness would be Trinitarian Christianity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The the existence of, I mean, not to psychoanalyze or do anything like this, right? But so uh, two different individuals, three different individuals as one, and the working out of that, right? And then the way that um, Christians should have or could have or did or did not throughout history internalize that and yeah. you have a voice inside of you that is the Holy Spirit and your participation in the broader community, Absolutely. et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And so um, uh, I thought that was yes. really interesting. I love that you sparked that. Just want to say real quick that I actually argue, and I was alluding to this in my master's thesis, 127 pages back in uh, 2010, that Protestant Christianity lost, that gives us a false sense of double consciousness with the two kingdoms doctrine and with the two swords doctrine, if you're familiar with Luther and Calvin. So okay. I believe that that's a false Well, so and this is what I wanted to ask, right? Because um, there's a sense, and maybe you could just say that uh, really this is a failure on the part of Christians not to understand the double consciousness that should have come on trip whatever you want to say, right? Yeah. Whether the Holy Spirit... Individualities. Is, yeah, whether, whatever the Holy Spirit might be representing here. Yeah. Like, that... Is this a failure on the part of this tradition in history to understand the teachings of their own tradition? Or... Correct. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to hear Myron's opinion. Okay, well, uh, I, 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 well, I... Or, is, so yeah. is this now... Is this Du Bois is really teaching uh, Western often Christian Europeans, mm -hmm. the meaning of their own sort of tradition or something That's like that. That's a great, great question. So remember that quote that I read you, the famous double consciousness quote uh, in uh, Souls of uh, Black Folk. Um, notice the first lines. He talks as if humanity's a family, and the Negro's the seventh son. I've always thought of the divine more as a family. And so the individual to me is not really an individual. It's kind of like a hidden family already. So... I think that we've gotten away from thinking about the divine and that kind of divine family. And that's why I do like, uh, even if you're not a Christian, it's like, hey, we got a mansion with many rooms in it. We got a big family, a big tent. Yeah. That sense to me is much richer. Well, and and it's, it's not just yeah. Hegel, it's all of them. There's this weird ambiguity between are we talking about me as the individual human or are we talking about the divine life or something like that, mm -hmm. like shelling yes. for you, obviously, yes. right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that uh, ambiguity, like of this double consciousness, is not just about God; it's also about me. It's mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just uh, really interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I had a sort of follow up to this, which is I, I think maybe you know what, what went through my head when when uh, Jared was talking about the Trinity is I think the problem is that that was a limited vision because it was still nonetheless associated with perfection. That God the has this, yeah. yeah, God has this kind of perfection. And that if you think about it, that's part of a family of conceptual tropes with sort of completeness mm -hmm. and also individuality there you go. and self closeness. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that put a limit on how much work that could do. Whereas, you know, the, the oppositional sort of family of conceptual tropes would be, you know, incompleteness, imperfection, uh, you know, relation, and things like that. So it kind of went through my head, or sure. that was probably the limit. Yeah. yeah, those definitely were major influences that blocked uh, or impeded uh, the ability for us to, to go deeper into... Um, the explication process of what was what was latent or what was implicit, it was already there. Yeah. And, the, and you see American pragmatists talk about this in the literature as the relational self. Mm -hmm. I'm hesitant to use the notion of self just because it has so many, it's had so much baggage. Mm -hmm. And so, but I know what they're trying to get at. I think that they're trying to get at individuality. They're trying to get at the ways in which you're cut, the ways in which you are divided, the ways in which you have to compromise and negotiate. And this to me is not only richer, it's more interesting to use the white head sense of novelty. Uh, it's more interesting. And this is how you actually get at who people are. 
to get at who people are, you need to get into their stories. This is their personal testimony. This is really their history and how they're cut and how they're divided. And when we talk about individuals or selves, we don't really get into people's history. We have a thin actuality that we're addressing, and it becomes those uh, ready-mades, those abstract ready-mades that we throw around. And then you get into identity politics. And I didn't say much about it because my time was uh, coming to a close, but the identity politics for me is so toxic. I think we all know this. Even people who engage in it, it becomes so toxic because it has to do with uh, not having the kind of hospitality and the kind of openness to see the ways in which people are already the other and not only the other, but the unfriendly other. And that's important to me uh, in the sense of you're already impure. You're already incomplete. So give up on those notions. The way I teach it to my students or try to teach it to them is human beings are kind of cursed or in a predicament where we're not going to be able to give up the notion of perfection. We look around and we immediately say, oh, I see you got a hole in your shirt. You know? <laughs> or I see, oh, this, this isn't clean. You know, it's got some coffee on the rim. Uh, it, why do you pick those things out immediately? Right? It's almost as if it's innate in us to have a kind of standard that we are evaluating the world by and that we deviate from. Now, so a lot of people think the standard's shallow, and it may be, but you can't deny it's there. When you see a car going down the street, oh, it's missing a tail light or you, something along those lines is what you pick out. It's what, that's a phenomenology of error in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And so what's making us deviate, what's making us find the error? There's a deviation there. So I don't try to tell people to give up on, there's no such thing as perfection, there's no such thing as completeness. I think they're there. <coughs> but they're more uh, fuzzy, mm -hmm. uh, loose, vague uh, modifiers or qualifiers for our experience, and they're not to be absolutized. And that's why I also think that Du Bois is not a German idealist, because I think he's trying to get away from the kind of absolutization that even Schelling, toward the end of his um, philosophical career in life, was trying to move away from as well. Yes, sir. Okay, so my page of questions notwithstanding, the most interesting <laughs> two things that I want to bring up, or at least suggest to you, okay. is in your critique of identity politics, I think there's a nice pairing with your earlier concept of individual and individual mm -hmm. that you talk about, which is the literal I-identity. I think you have an opportunity for an undentity mm -hmm. there that mm. pairs with the individual yeah. when it yeah. comes to the political aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, so sure. that's just my suggestion there, sure. especially when you talk about identity politics, politics being toxic. It's not just toxic with stereotype threat and what we do to one another, mm -hmm. but there's an autotoxicity to it where it's, your, it's toxic to oneself yes. to practice it as yeah. well. And I, this brings me to my question. Do you see, even in the case of stereotype threat, in that um, self-definition of being cut as the individual, in one way, do you see a, cre a creative implosion that's kind of the toxic counterpart to the creative explosion that you get when you are open to novelty? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that still a sense of creation, only a toxic creation? Or how yeah, do you do so that I, put it, I put it in a little different language, so see if this uh, links up with what you're referring to. I talk about it in terms of, you talked about the heartbeat during here, and I talked about the heart as well. Uh, contraction and expansion, this is more Schellingian uh, in his speculative physics. Mm -hmm. um, so contraction in the sense of um, the uh, implosion and uh, expansion in the sense of the explosion. And recognizing the movements within that mm -hmm. makes it for a more dynamic account of your personal identity or undentity uh, rather than a, a static account, mm -hmm. uh, which is assuming that there's a stationary, there's always a kind of underlying substratum. This is what Kant hated about substance ontology, right? There's always that underlying substratum that is always lurking in the background, and that's again what I think uh, Ferris sees even in Du Bois. This is something that he didn't move away from, I don't think, when it comes to German idealism and his fidelity to the dialectical method. But I think that I didn't mention this in the paper, but it just came to me that someone like Martin Buber and the I Thou relationship mm -hmm. is a, trying to get at as well this notion of um, implosion, explosion, uh, expansion, contraction. So 
I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a time for it? Yeah. Um, I didn't think by the title of your paper that you were going to talk about the, how noxious identity politics is. <laughs> 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 I was like, wow, okay. Yeah, let's go. Go, go. So, so, I, but, so I just want, I want to bring this kind of down to give a really down, ask you a really down there question. Yeah. Um, with a little bit of a philosophical stand at the end, which is, what makes each of us unique, do you think? Because you talk about this plurality. Yep. And even when you are contesting um, certain dialectic views, you kind of contest it with your own dialectic, double consciousness, you know, position. So I wonder if you, I wonder what you think, that's a down there question, what makes each of us unique and hence an individual, um, and and do you think there's a premeditated, premediated, or preconscious element to what does make us, you know, each? Excellent, each excellent. Individual? You took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to say that for me, individuality, and I'm just referring here to Whitehead's Adventures of Ideas, is immediacy, or like you were saying, the premediated, and um, that that intensity, that 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 intensity, is where we encounter a kind of raw individuality. He calls it something like the stubbornness of fact. Uh, and so that, and, and uh, to, to go off of the, uh, your first uh, suggestion, which very good question or a very good uh, issue uh, that you bring up. So I wanted to emphasize the inversion of the dialectic, but more importantly, not any dialectic, whether it's non-inverted or inverted, I believe it has to do more with our stories. So our biographies and the ways in which we are made interesting and unique. And our interest and passion. Yes, yes, yes. And all of these things become a kind of matrix where uh, uh, it becomes a kind of matrix where the self is only a metaphor for all of that treasure of um, who we are. And so I see it as our biographies and our stories or the personalization. I see, I do. Uh, you bring in the binary of the personal and the impersonal. It may be a little rough or cheap, but I think that once you get more into the intimate, once you get more into the personal, into one stories, that's when you're getting more into something like individuality or uniqueness that we normally are associating with um, individuals. So, um, yeah, stories and biographies, and I think that's actually also how you rob people. If you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to mess with people. Uh, and uh, dehumanize people. Vico said you mess with the way they worship their gods and marry each other and also how they bury their dead. I would also add to it, you don't let them tell their stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Social media is a kind of problem in this sense because it gives us the notion that you can always tell your story. But the way in which you tell the story it becomes a kind of Benjamin mechanical reproduction and it loses its aura. You use means to tell your story. There, there you go. It starts <laughs> losing its aura yeah. and that's not really your story. <laughs> exactly. And, and I would say that don't, I wouldn't necessarily outright blame those people for using means to tell their story. They're wanting to be heard and they think that these kinds of virtual digital lures are the way in which they're going to be heard. Even though it's not really their story, I would agree. It's, you know, a, gener a, gen uh, a generic version or a kind of um, impersonal version. But yeah, I want to emphasize that uh, in, telling, in telling the personal stories, they've been drowned out by the uh, mechanical reproduction and losing of the aura of people uh, being actually heard, being listened to. So I am working on a lot of research right now related to the notion of learning, uh, re-listening again. I'm always hesitant to use again these days because of uh, we've all heard again a lot. But uh, you just used it again. <laughs> re learning to listen, relearning to listen, or listening again. So. Okay. Well, I think we're we've hit two fifty, haven't we? Yeah, two fifty. Yeah, there we go. Thank We've you. Got eight minutes Thank before you. the next session starts. <laughs> Thank you, Myron. Thank you.